stuff. And, uh, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I know we get started. I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco. I have the good fortune of coordinating our global health initiative and directing our environmental change and security program. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our final session in the 2010 Maternal Health Series here at the Woodrow Wilson Center under our Global Health Initiative and my colleague, Kayla Nostrowski. Uh, it has been um, a, a very active year, a very terrific year, and uh, we're so pleased to have as a capstone uh, a session on maternal undernutrition implementing effective solutions. This has been a partnership from the very beginning um, with our partners and and funders UNFPA and the Maternal Health Task Force. Um, we've also benefited greatly from technical support from USAID and particularly Mary Ellen Stanton, our chair for today, moderator for today. So it's been a great pleasure to have this series. We are hopeful and we hope to be able to um, announce something relatively soon to have some news, but we are, we are hopeful and expecting to be able to continue focusing on maternal health issues uh, through two, uh, 2011 as well. And so stay, stay tuned on, on that front. Uh, just a word about where we're sitting. The Wilson Center, as I think a number of you know, is the formal memorial to Wilson. He was our only president to have a PhD, so Congress set up this nonpartisan non-advocacy forum to bring the worlds of scholarship and policy and practice together uh, for kind of mutual dialogue, mutual interaction, and mutual learning. Um, so we, we do that here at the center on a wide range of topics um, and under our global health initiative really focusing on maternal health um, as we have uh, this last year. I'm, um, I'm really just to, to, to say uh, welcome and pass it to Mary Ellen Stanton, who, as you know, is a senior maternal health advisor at USAID. One piece of housekeeping before I do that, we are webcasting today's event uh, live on the Internet. What that means for us in the room really is just when we come to the <laughs> Q&A, if you could wait for one of my colleagues to bring you a microphone and uh, so the folks online can hear your questions. Um, and then for you folks online, you can find the PowerPoint slides in PDF format on the website where you linked to the video so that you can more easily follow along because I think the camera will stay, stay on our speakers rather than showing the slides. So Mary Ellen, I'll turn the floor over to you. And again, welcome to everyone. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to be here, uh, particularly uh, to have a couple hours to talk about um, th this very, very important topic. Uh, I can see here certainly many faces that are new to me, but uh, some others that I am so happy to see again. It may have been some time since, since we have uh, talked. I think that the this area of maternal nutrition is probably, as you know, well, so often overlooked uh, as a strategy for reducing poverty and as a key intervention to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity. Uh, in the child arena, it's different. I think uh, nutrition uh, is much more widely appreciated than in the maternal health arena. Today, uh, we're here, I think, to do three things. One, to uh, have a look at the evidence, uh, to gather insights about the linkage between nutritional status um, uh, of women and key issues uh, related to poverty and health. And of course, with women and pregnant women particularly, it moves right into child health. And thirdly, to consider experience about effective strategies to address this problem of maternal undernutrition. Uh, I consider myself someone outside the nutrition community. Um, I, uh, and I think this is probably really important in that um, there are different communities, intellectual and professional communities out there. Uh, as someone as who I see uh, myself as an outsider, really, um, I'm really here to expand my knowledge on, on evidence and, and uh, programming opportunities and experience. Um, I bring this up because I think that in the maternal world we've been heavily influenced 
uh, by professional uh, medical people and surgeons. We've also been heavily influenced by community mobilizers. Um, and uh, in the recent uh, time, in the last few years, we're now uh, influenced and uh, influencing um, economic specialists, particularly financial, financial specialists, as they identify and uh, push various uh, economic levers to draw women into services. Uh, there are certainly others who have a huge number of others who have contributed nutrition as well. Uh, but I think the the uh, uh, intersection between the, if you will, the nutrition community and the maternal health community hasn't been close. Uh, as Amy said earlier, we were talking, it's sort of like this, it's parallel going on. Sometimes it sort of touches. It doesn't necessarily work like this. Um, and then we bring forth what I think are simplistic notions of integration uh, and we'll add nutrition on or we'll add maternal health on to nutrition. Uh, but that hasn't always uh, brought the the, the right level of attention to some of these important issues. Uh, so I think this is a great opportunity today to look back at uh, evidence, experience, and, and linkages on this. We are really happy today to have, have uh, two presenters. Uh, first will be Dr. Doyen Oluwole, who uh, is Director of Africa's Health in 2010. Uh, project, USAID project at AAD in, in Washington. She previously worked as the World Health Organization um, at the Regional Office for Africa for over 10 years and was Director of Family and Reproductive Health. Um, she's a, a medical doctor from the University of Lagos uh, and a fellow of the Royal College of Pediatrics in the UK. Uh, and among the many things that she has done, she has championed the conceptualization, development, and early implementation of the roadmap for accelerating uh, attainment of the Millennium Development Goals uh, for maternal and newborn health in Africa. It doesn't do justice to the many other things she's done. Dr. Amy uh, Webb Gerard is Assistant Professor of Maternal and Child Nutrition uh, at the Hubert Department of Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Uh, she has a PhD in Nutrition and Health Sciences from Emory. And uh, she is a uh, expert and teaches and lectures uh, on, among other things, qualitative methods, food systems, and, and food security, um, and maternal and, and child nutrition. Uh, among the many things that uh, she has done uh, and is doing now, she is interestingly uh, conducting research in, in um, she has conducted research in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, currently, she and colleagues at Emory and University of Toronto are working with partners in Kenya, Nigeria, and India uh, to develop and test community-based strategies to improve maternal nutrition, infant feeding practices, and food security. So we have with us two great experts with a lot of experience. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Olawole first. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. It's a pleasure to share the stage with you this morning. And thanks to the organizers for asking me to give this presentation. Uh, my focus this morning would be on basically the relationship between maternal undernutrition and poverty. I'm going to be giving examples of the implications of this to the community uh, development the community. I'm also going to be looking at certain countries that have made progress in reducing undernutrition. And I'm going to pay particular attention to Malawi and see how they did it and the challenges 
that they faced. <coughs> Globally, we all know that the gross national product of any nation is an indication of or is related to the poverty level. And here in this slide, we see that the lower the GNP per capita in any country, the higher the percentage of under five children that are undernourished. And you can see here, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the relationship remains the same. But we need to take cognizance of the fact that you do not necessarily improve nutrition by just increasing GNP per capita. There are other factors that contribute to improvement in nutritional status. And some of these are the social determinants of undernutrition, which include basic causes, underlying causes, but also the immediate causes. The basic causes and underlying causes, as you would see here in the slide, include issues that are non-health related. Socioeconomic factors, political context, lack of capital, whether that capital is human, financial, natural resources, and also income poverty. This is extremely important, whether people have access to employment, whether they have access to land, to assets, to property in any way. And the immediate causes are mainly health related, inadequate dietary intake, and of course, diseases. So we are not medicalizing undernutrition because there are other non health factors that determine the state of nutrition. And in this slide, I'm trying to bring it down to country level. We see four countries in Africa, Burkina, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Namibia, and of, in Asia, Bangladesh, and India. Here, it is obvious that even within a particular country, there's gross inequity. And this inequity shows itself by the fact that the proportion of undernourished women is higher in the lowest wealth quintile. And this is not surprising to all of us because we see this relationship in practically all indicators of health. So why is this the case? I'd like to quickly show you this graphic. When you talk of general malnutrition, it's usually accompanied or associated with iron deficiency anemia. And this is a major cause of poor cognitive function and of course, educational achievement, poor health, and fatigue. These three factors contribute to low worker productivity, and low worker productivity leads to income poverty. And when you look at it further, you find that income poverty boxes an individual into food insecurity, frequent infections, probably teenage pregnancies, frequent pregnancies, large families, and these are the people who are likely to be involved in physical hard labor. And all of this aggravate malnutrition. And so the vicious cycle of malnutrition and poverty continues. So why are we focusing on undernutrition of women? Take note, I am using the word women and this is deliberate. We will start off with women and then hone down to maternal undernutrition. A woman is not just known by her reproductive role. She has a productive role, she has a reproductive role. In her productive role, women are approximately 50% of the workforce in many countries, and so we cannot push them aside but they have a peculiar reproductive role, giving life to the next generation. And if we, as a development community, would get a chance to improve on these two roles, we would be breaking the cycle of malnutrition and poverty. Also, 
as a development community, we have committed ourselves to the Millennium Development Goals. The first six Millennium Development Goals are impacted by malnutrition or undernutrition. Look at all of this. Undernutrition is a major factor in the sense that it erodes human capital through irreversible and intergenerational effects on the cognitive function. And when you look at the chances that a child will go to school, stay in school, and perform well, undernutrition plays a role. When you look at development of a child, the schooling, the work, and productivity potentials, these are all impacted by undernutrition. And let's come to what Mary Ellen said earlier on, child mortality and morbidity impacted by undernutrition. Globally, at least a third of childhood deaths are underlined by malnutrition or undernutrition. And in some countries, it goes as high as 50%. And look at maternal health, morbidity, mortality. Undernutrition predisposes the woman especially if she's anemic alongside it, to postpartum hemorrhage, maternal anemia in pregnancy, malaria, and of course, if she has to undergo surgery, there is a further complication. So all of this need to be taken into consideration. In the world of HIV, undernutrition predisposes anybody, and the woman in particular, to HIV because of compromised immunity, compromises ART care. It enhances and hastens the development of AIDS as a disease. And of course, when you think of co-infections, TB, malaria, this is also a factor. So we cannot wave it aside. I'm showing this slide just to make a quick point. Many of us pay particular attention to severe anemia. But we know that even moderate anemia is a major contributor to maternal mortality. And it's been shown clearly, and I'm sure Amy will talk more about this, so I'm not going to waste time on it. For every one gram per deciliter increase in maternal hemoglobin during pregnancy, you have significant decrease in maternal mortality. So when can we make a difference? I'm showing this so that we can see the 1,000 days that can make a difference, i.e., during pregnancy and the first two years of life. We can make a big difference. If we start off with a malnourished woman, sorry, the, the pointer is not working. I could have shown you what I'm talking about, but if you look at the blue circle, you have it divided into two. The blue circle represents all women, and you have them as women non-pregnant but of reproductive age, and you have the other half pregnant woman. Now, depending on where we start, if we start with a woman who is undernourished, then she gets pregnant, and she has low, birth, low weight gain during pregnancy, then her fetus is inadequately nourished during pregnancy. And of course, the outcome of that is low birth weight. And if you have a low birth weight infant, you end up with a stunted child, a stunted adolescent. But if we can do it right, between the blue and the yellow circle, we will make a big difference in this life cycle. Let's look at the first two years of life. That window of opportunity, we do know that any damage that is done to physical growth, brain function, or human capital development during the first two years of life tends to be extensive and irreversible. And so any investments that we need to make as a development community needs to be during this critical time. Outside of that period, 
we are less likely to be able to catch up. What are the implications of all this for us? I'm coming back to this slide because again, as international development community, we have committed ourselves to this. Every one of these six MDGs wears a woman's face. Look at them. I'm not going to read them one by one, but if you look at the poverty and hunger, you look at primary education or education even beyond the primary level, gender, you look at child mortality, maternal mortality, HIV. All of this wear a woman's face. And she's further compromised if she is pregnant. And therefore, it is extremely important for us to pay attention. And let's see what then we can do during these windows of opportunity that we have. I'm not going to read all of the details in the boxes. They are well known to us. But I want to point out to us that as you look at the boxes and the actions that we can take, they are multi-pronged, multi-sectoral. We cannot afford to approach them just health way. We have to do health and non-health interventions. And a particular attention to be paid to early initiation of breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding, continued breastfeeding with adequate, frequent, and rich complementary feeding for the child. Not to forget the early child development and stimulation and education. These all go together. And we must ensure that the child goes to school. That's all part of the MDG commitment. And when the child is in school, then we must ensure that they have high quality food intake. The adolescent tends to be neglected, tends to be forgotten in terms of diet, in terms of general health, and even all her other needs. We need to ensure that the adolescent continues in school and pay attention to their nutrition, not only in developing countries, but even in developed countries. And we must make sure that this adolescent, who herself may get pregnant, gets the necessary iron folate, folic acid supplement, and as much as possible, postpone the age of pregnancy, postpone the age of marriage. What can we do for the woman at that stage? All women in the box that is on my extreme left, all women should have some form of livelihood. This is the way to empower the woman so that she can you know, maintain herself, she can care for her health, she can seek care, and she, she does not depend always on somebody to make decisions for her. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of family planning. Iron and folic acid. And when she gets pregnant, in addition to all that we have in that far left box, we must remember focused antenatal care, increased quantities of iron folic acid, and of course, to reduce her workload, which is a big issue in developing countries. Basic anemia package, let's make it an integrated approach. All of this need to be taken into consideration. So it's not just the IFA. We must look into prevention, treatment of infections, malaria, deworming, extra food. It's a, it's a whole package. Now, some countries have made significant progress. What did they do? Let's look at some of them. They stimulate economic growth. They implemented targeted social health and nutrition programs, and they put in place safety nets. The four countries that I have listed here, China, Thailand, Brazil, and Mexico, are middle-income countries. But what is important about them is you see that they actually ad adopted a multi-sectoral approach. They did not just address health. Now, Malawi is a poor country, but it is experiencing major changes in its nutrition uh, indicators at country level. 
And I would like to spend a few minutes to look at Malawi as a case study. In 2004, according to the Malawi DHS survey, 48% of under fives were stunted. 22% of under fives were underweight. And 20%, one in five babies, were low birth weight. That was poor. And amidst that, they decided that this is a national emergency because they applied the profiles. And profiles made it clear that Malawi was losing almost $71 million over every five-year period or so due to all of these problems because the severe malnutrition that they were witnessing led to delayed enrollment in school, it led, it led to dropout in schools, and it compromised academic and professional development. And it, they said this was going to have a long-term impact on their national capital development. And so they decided to declare malnutrition a silent national crisis. And so what actions did they take? They defined the problem. What was crucial about the definition of the problem was that they did not just say this is a national emergency or this is a national crisis. They said malnutrition is a biomedical, social, cultural, medical, and political issue. Five dimensions. And they brought people from all these sectors to work together, but government was in the lead. And having defined the problem, then they engaged in high-level advocacy. And this advocacy was such that the head of state, the president, decided to put the Office of Nutrition in his office, together with HIV and they decided we're going to take this headlong and fight it. And they had a permanent secretary that was responsible, and they brought together development partners. They had public-private partnerships. They brought in all of the different levels, the province and the district and the communities, and they involved their politicians, parliamentarians. They went out, they talked to the people, and then they decided we're going to do something different. They took all their policies, the national strategic policy, they included nutrition into it, and came out with an integrated approach to addressing malnutrition. Alongside this, they continued to monitor their progress. Of course, the very first thing that they saw was that setting themselves a target gave them the opportunity to be able to move and be driven and be stimulated to take action. They revised all of their policies. They revised all their guidelines. They developed new IEC materials, and they sent all the people out to make sure that they could get right to the grassroots. They said 30% reduction in malnutrition or undernutrition in our country would help us to gain between 2006 and 2015 83 million dollars in productivity and that was an impetus a stimulus for everybody to just be on deck and of course they set up committees gender committees they set up essential health package agricultural development committees, all of this worked together just because they wanted to address malnutrition. And of course, at the end of it, they witnessed major changes in their country. The very first thing that they noticed was that the Malawi DHS of 2004, which had showed stunting at 48%, by 2009, from the micronutrient survey went down to, 2000, uh, to 36 percent. 
and women under nutrition fell to as low as 4% in a country where 53% of maternal deaths were due to anemia. And in addition to this, they had economic growth increased from 2.3% to 9.7% and poverty reduced from 65% to 45% in 2007 in three years. What were the challenges they faced in doing this? It was keeping the stakeholders and partners engaged and committed because they were changing and competing priorities. Other things came on the stage and attention got distracted. So how could they do this? Malawi is one of those poor countries, not only financially, but even in human resource. So there was low institutional and human capacity, quantity and quality wise, but they tried to put together a multi-sectoral um, uh, body, but these sectoral coordinators were lacking at the local council level. They had low resource allocation in some sectors. Even though government increased its allocation to, to nutrition, but it was still not enough for what needed to be addressed. Many of the programs that had been in existence prior to this time were project-oriented, limited geographically, limited impact, and so limited coverage. And then the district and community level coordination was very weak. I'll just take a quick breeze at some of the other interventions that have been applied and have succeeded. Linkages project, which was a USAID funded project led by AED, in 2006 came up with this uh, results in their large scale program that looked at, you can see various countries in Africa and in Middle East, Jordan, and the populations that were covered. And what they did was mainly community-based interventions, just educating mothers, training health workers, and making sure that the messages reached the women at the critical points at home and at the health facility. And you can see all of the areas that were covered in each country. I won't go into the details here. But what then happened? They found within five, three to five years of the work that they were doing that in different countries, timely initiation of breastfeeding rates increased dramatically. And you can see in particular for Madagascar, Zambia, and Bolivia that these were truly statistically significant. In Madagascar, it more than doubled. And exclusive breastfeeding rates increased. Infants bre exclu exclusively breastfed for six months in all the countries. You can see the impact. Other globally applied strategies that have made a big difference in the nutrition world and have actually achieved coverage that can be said to be significant are these ones. We must not forget, salt iodization has made a big difference. It's a fortification method. It's highly cost effective. It is sustainable. Vitamin A supplementation, whether through campaigns or through routine use. Breastfeeding promotion, we've talked about that. So what are some of the recommendations? We all, as a development community, must adopt a multi-sectoral approach in solving this problem. And therefore, I put forward first promoting primary, universal primary and secondary education, especially for girls, as a critical step. We must focus on economic strengthening. This leads to empowerment of the woman. And if this is combined with education, then it makes all the difference in her life. And we must apply a gender and equity lens when we do economic strengthening. And we must invest in infrastructure that decreases the burden of the time that is spent by women and girls on routine chores. 
electricity, transportation, water, sanitation. A World Bank report showed that 87% of, trans of transport that is done in Africa, in some rural places, is actually by walking. And that this takes 65% of the woman's time. So what more energy does she have to do other things? And that's a challenge to us. Postpone the age of marriage and, of course, the age of forced pregnancy. And what we are more familiar with, we must provide direct nutrition and health interventions. Those that I have talked about, others that we would raise in the course of these discussions, and we must scale up. We are all aware of this framework, I'm sure. All the key development partners have signed up to the SUN framework. It's a good framework. We should work with it. We should apply it. And in doing this, we need to strengthen the health systems. This is something that I have shouted and I will keep talking about until we really see change on ground. Strengthening health systems. In conclusion, maternal undernutrition is undeniably linked with poverty. And those of us who are here are examples of people who have had exposure to education and have been well nourished, hopefully, and that's why we are able to be where we are today. A multi, multiple factors contribute to maternal undernutrition. And so the solution also must be multi-pronged. And therefore, a multi-sectoral approach is what we must adopt to reduce this, using both the health system's response, which we have talked about, but also a range of social, economic, and political <coughs> actions that put on the gender and equity lens. And we must look at other countries. What have they done? How have they succeeded in doing it? And replicate this. But one thing is central to this. In every country, the government must be in leadership. And they should make sure that they include the private sector. After all, where does iron and folic, folic acid come from? Private sector produced. Salt, <coughs> vitamin A. So they should be on board with us to solve the problem. And I just want to acknowledge all the Africa 2010 staff who have helped to review, to contribute. Particularly, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Kathleen Coz and others who have you know, participated in producing this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doyen, for such a eloquent presentation that uh, frames this whole big picture for us. I think uh, with your indulgence, we will go ahead and hear uh, Dr. Webb Gerard's presentation, uh, and then we will open this up for comments and questions. So good morning. I'm very grateful to be here. I find this an extremely exciting venue for discussing my passion, which is nutrition. That is actually where my focus has been for many, many years, has been on actual nutrition of women and children with respect to micronutrient, macronutrient nutrition, micronutrient supplementation, and those types of strategies. And so to be able to integrate that with interests of the maternal health community, I think, is extremely critical. So nutrition is considered the cornerstone of good health, as Mary Ellen told us. But it's often overlooked as a key strategy for actually improving health outcomes. In 1998, at the Maternal Nutrition Symposium in Paris, Jose Mora and Penelope Nessel discussed how this lack of attention on maternal nutrition may actually be hindering progress made on maternal health. And at that session in 98, they identified multiple strategies for how we can increase the attention on maternal nutrition, how we can improve the evidence how we can improve the way we deliver maternal nutrition and health strategies. More than 10 years after this call for attention, many in, in my community, in the nutrition community, 
would argue that the, the role of maternal nutrition to improve maternal, neonatal, and child health outcomes, however, is still very much underappreciated. Um, so in this talk, I would like to discuss briefly, and it would be very brief, <laughs> the evidence of a role for maternal nutrition itself in maternal health outcomes, the efficacy and effectiveness of some tested strategies, and as well, what work is needed with respect to research in both nutrition and health, and other strategies for improving maternal nutrition and in turn maternal health. So when we talk about maternal nutrition, we tend to think in terms of macronutrient malnutrition, which manifests as underweight and low stature, and micronutrient deficiencies, and some commonly used indicators and their global prevalences I've, I've put up here. Now while underweight and low BMI tend to reflect more short-term undernutrition, as Doyen pointed out, low stature, low height is actually a reflection of long-term chronic malnutrition that initiates in very early childhood. By the time a woman reaches adulthood, insults to her stature, to her height, are largely irreversible. Micronutrient deficiencies are also used as indicators of undernutrition. However, we have good global prevalence data for only a couple, namely iodine, vitamin A deficiency, and anemia. And now I say anemia as opposed to iron deficiency because, in fact, we don't have a lot of good prevalence data on specific indicators of iron deficiency. Anemia is typically used as our proxy. But that can be quite problematic because, in actuality, anemia is caused by multiple, multiple factors, including infection and chronic inflammation, malaria, other vitamin deficiencies like vitamin A and folic acid, blood loss from perhaps either intestinal parasites, gastrointestinal diseases, menstruation, and some homoglobin, ah, sickle cell disease, <laughs> thalassemias and the like, that actually distort the red blood cells themselves. Now it's estimated that about 42% of all women of reproductive age and 52% of pregnant women have anemia within developing country settings. Substantially more than that have iron deficiency, and actually the WHO suggests that for the prevalence of anemia, double that, actually by two and a half times, and that will give you your general estimate of iron deficiency in your population. So globally, we're looking at about two billion people who are iron deficient, and the majority of those are women and children. And about half of that anemia that we see globally is due to iron deficiency, though this varies depending on what region you're in with respect to the infectious disease burden of that population. So despite quite a bit of knowledge around iron deficiency, we still have had very little progress. With respect to iodine deficiency and vitamin A deficiency, we've been making progress on those. We've seen drastic reductions in iodine deficiency due to salt iodization, and vitamin A deficiency because of postpartum and vitamin A supplementation, as well as early child vitamin A supplementation, so we've made progress. But anemia is still widespread around the world in all regions, including developed country settings, though to a less extent with respect to public health significance. It's prevalent in both in a significant public health burden in women of reproductive age as well as in pregnant women. So it is a huge issue that we're dealing with. Now, so I've laid the groundwork with respect to what we know to be the global burden of micronutrient undernutrition as well as low BMI and low stature. But does this actually impact maternal health outcomes? We have quite a bit of understanding of the impact of maternal nutrition and how it impacts fetal outcomes and how it may potentially even impact infant and child health outcomes. But by and large, we don't tend to look at maternal nutrition and its impact on the woman herself and what it means for her health and her survival, which is why I tend to label maternal undernutrition as a, as a global disgrace. So when we look at the data that's available to establish a link with respect to maternal undernutrition and key maternal health outcomes, we have limited data to work with limited studies that actually collect data on maternal outcomes and maternal nutritional status. And I can't emphasize enough the extent to which this hampers our ability to move maternal nutrition onto the agenda of health and development. 
For example, we have limited research on the role of both underweight, pregnancy weight gain, and low status, low stature, with respect to maternal mortality outcomes as a direct cause. We have quite a bit of evidence suggesting that both underweight and low stature increase risk of mortality through indirect causes, namely obstructed labor. In fact, low stature was associated with a 60% increase in the need for assisted delivery by a meta-analysis conducted by WHO um, in the mid-2000s. With respect to micronutrient deficiencies, a little bit more is known about impacts on maternal health, and this is largely a result of randomized controlled supplementation trials. However, many of these are not powered to examine maternal mortality, so we still have some limitations with respect to the amount of evidence we have to provide um, support for this linkage. It has been estimated that vitamin A deficiency increases risk of maternal mortality about fourfold, but that data comes from one study in Nepal, and additional studies are needed on that. So most of our knowledge is on the morbidity of the woman that she experiences during pregnancy and with respect to poor pregnancy outcomes. For example, we have quite a bit of information on the role iodine deficiency plays with respect to goiter and hypothyroidism during pregnancy. As well, there is very strong evidence to suggest calcium deficiency contributes substantially to hypertensive disorders during pregnancy, namely eclampsia and severe hypertension. In fact, supplementation trials of calcium in calcium insufficient populations show about a 30% reduction in hypertension, severe hypertension, and eclampsia. So there is evidence of a causal link there. There is very strong, oh, I'm sorry, there is also only limited evidence with respect to zinc deficiency. And we have estimated that zinc deficiency is actually a huge global burden. And it's emerging, the global burden that it is. However, we have done very little with respect to quantifying the burden in women and in pregnant women and in looking at how zinc deficiency influences maternal health as well as fetal, neonatal, and child health outcomes. Now, with respect to iron and anemia, we know that severe anemia is a risk factor for maternal mortality through a multitude of mechanisms. Severe anemia, looking at hemoglobins of less than five grams per deciliter, they contribute substantially to cardiac decompensation. The body can't get enough oxygen to necessary tissues, the heart works overtime leading to cardiac decompensation, pulmonary embolism, and edema, and then death. And that is a well-stated knowledge, I believe. <laughs> um, and it's estimated that between 4 and about 15 percent of maternal mortality is directly attributed to severe anemia with respect to this type of mechanism. Evidence for moderate anemia and mild anemia is a bit limited, but we do have evidence with respect to their indirect contributions to mortality, namely because modern anemia may increase the risk of postpartum hemorrhage and may increase the risk of sepsis, as well as increase or decrease the ability of a woman to tolerate blood loss and hence her risk for dying during an epi uh, episode of postpartum hemorrhage. With respect to anemia in general and blood loss during pregnancy, irrespective of whether that goes into postpartum hemorrhage, Anemia, even mild anemia, is associated with significantly greater blood loss than non-anemia, or than the non-anemic state. With respect to the quantified contribution, if you will, of anemia to maternal mortality, Doyen produced the slides that uh, Dr. Stolfus analyzed back in 2003 for the WHO work on quantifiable health risks. And they estimated that for every one gram per deciliter increase in anemia, you could reduce maternal mortality by approximately 25%. And there was a lot of contention in the field on this estimate. But then the Lancet redid the meta-analysis, similar findings, and then more recently, and this data is unpublished, but um, Dr. Murray Kolb and colleagues at Cornell, I'm sorry, at Johns Hopkins, using the CHURG review system, have redone these analyses using separate and very different analytical strategies, and they have included more studies that have been published since 2002, and they find very similar results as well, such that with each gram per deciliter increase in anemia, 
or in hemoglobin, you decrease the risk of mortality by approximately 25%. Now, the mechanisms by which that occurs are not well elucidated, so I leave that with you as, as it is. However, I think it's interesting to note that the one gram per deciliter increase that we're seeing and that they're using as their standard is actually the level of increase you could see in hemoglobin in a population if you had effective iron and folic acid supplementation. With effective iron and folic acid supplementation, you can generally shift the anemia curve between 0.8 grams per deciliter and about 1.2 grams per deciliter in a population. So effective iron and folic acid supplementation then could help bump this anemia situation with respect to mortality. However, people still argue about that number and about those studies and about the available evidence. So I want to say then forget about the mortality issue then if you have problems with that. Anemia is a significant contributor to morbidity such that that alone is a reason to do something about it with respect to increased risks of infection, increased risk of depression, fatigue, low work productivity, poor pregnancy outcomes with respect to low birth weight, as well as in girl children and adolescent girls, you have significant cognitive impairments with anemia. And that alone should be enough to keep anemia and iron deficiency on the agenda. Now, when we talk about undernutrition, it's hard to escape disparities between men and women with respect to global burden. Women bear a substantially larger burden of undernutrition than men. Some of that is due to biology, some of that's due to gender bias, and then also the exacerbating effects of poverty. But when we talk about the biology of nutrient needs, we have to understand then why women are deficient. It's because their dietary intakes are not meeting their needs. Women inherently have higher needs because of pregnancy, lactation, and menstruation, specifically for iron across the entire life course. But during pregnancy and lactation, needs of the woman for nutrients increase from 5 to 70 percent with respect to multiple micronutrients. Apologies. So as you'll see, we have a standard baseline need of iron. It drops slowly in the first trimester when we're no longer menstruating. And then that need increases dramatically during the second and third trimester when blood volume is expanding and the fetus is growing very rapidly. It's estimated that during the course of pregnancy, a woman needs 1,000 milligrams of iron. Now, most women cannot meet that using dietary intakes alone. It is too great of an amount. Even though absorption of iron does increase during this period to compensate, it's estimated that in order for women to be able to make it through pregnancy with just intakes alone to meet this need, they would have to come into pregnancy with stores of upwards of 300 milligrams. They would need that as a reserve. However, most developing countries and most places in general, that reserve is not there for a lot of women. So women enter pregnancy without the necessary reserves for avoiding anemia and complications due to iron deficiency. Sorry. And so I've just illustrated here quickly how the nutrient needs change with respect to the different life stages. For micronutrients and protein in general, infants and very young children have the highest needs per kilo of body weight because they're growing so very rapidly. But once you reach around adolescence and adulthood, men generally do have higher requirements. However, once you hit pregnancy and lactation, you see women's requirements go much greater. And those key nutrients especially are iron, zinc, and protein. But when you look at the key food sources of those critical nutrients, you'll notice a trend. Vitamin A vitamin B12, iron, zinc, iodine. By and large, your best sources of micronutrients are animal source foods. They're the most bioavailable, as well as being the richest source. However, in many settings, 
These are completely out of the reach of the population in general. Poverty inhibits the ability of many people to purchase these foods on a level that is consistent enough to improve their micronutrient status. In fact, if you look at the levels of global meat consumption across the world, it is extremely low, less than 10 kilos per capita per year in the countries that are most affected by anemia and other micronutrient deficiencies. And in addition, when we talk about why women have a higher burden, it's not just the biology. We could get around it if it were just the biology. But in fact, there are many areas in which gender and gender bias reduces a woman's ability to access healthy foods because in many settings, they eat last, they eat the least, and they eat the poorest quality foods because in many settings, the highest quality foods and the most food are reserved for the men and in some cases, the young children. In many instances, especially in some of the areas where we work, women are not able to make their own health-seeking decisions. They can't decide when they go or if they go seek health care. And so they are limited or dependent on others to get to antenatal care, to get to labor and delivery services, and are unable to do that on their own. When they do arrive, their services may be grossly inadequate. As well, women tend to have lower education globally, which is a problem because it reduces their ability to uptake nutrition education, health education messages, behavior change communication strategies. And then other gender bias issues mean that women are going to be at greater risk for poverty. In this world, women do 60% of the world's work and have less than 1% of the world's total assets. Huge gender disparity. They're going to have extremely heavy workloads with respect to gathering water and firewood. And they're going to have very limited access to land in order to promote their own livelihoods and to produce their own foods. And so this network of dependence factors, which Doyen greatly brought out earlier, is very important to understand if we want to move maternal nutrition and maternal health forward. So now I want to talk briefly about evidence for some of the impact that we have for nutritional interventions. And I'm going to talk about very specific interventions um, on a less global scale than what Doyen was presenting. So as was pointed out earlier, there, is, there are windows of opportunities. The first and key one is in that early childhood period, the first two years of life, and during pregnancy, so that first thousand days. However, we should also not fail, we should also, we need to also recognize that there are additional areas and venues where we can impact maternal health and maternal nutrition, namely the pre-pregnancy period so that we can increase women's stores so that they are replete when they enter pregnancy. Because as we all well know, women tend to go for pregnancy care very late. The impacts of nutritional deficiencies have already been set. The stage has already been set because we don't catch them early enough. So improving our ability to improve their status before they ever get pregnant is critical. So the pre-pregnancy and the inter-pregnancy period are where we can target women to improve their status when they are not actually pregnant. And that includes things like increasing birth intervals, increasing age at first marriage, maybe perhaps intermittent iron and folic acid supplementation, fortification strategies. And as we have at our disposal a huge arsenal of tested nutrition interventions, they've largely been tested in the context of child health and child survival, but we can make that transition and start testing them for maternal health and maternal survival as well. Now, the more immediate interventions that we tend to use, micronutrient supplementation, and fortification, we're all very aware of. These are strategies that are highly promoted. But we should not leave out sustainable strategies that do quite a bit to improve a woman's ability to feed herself, such as behavior change, communication strategies, 
And also strategies to increase access to high quality diets. These are all very important. We can't depend on just one strategy alone because as we've seen from previous presentation, nutrition is highly complex and involves multiple ways of getting at it. We also have at our disposal a number of non-nutritional interventions. We can treat and prevent malaria to reduce anemia. We can manage chronic diseases and inflammation. We can prevent and treat parasites because all of these increase nutrient requirements. And so managing these reduces the nutrient requirement. We can reduce workload and increase rest. And again, we can increase age at first pregnancy and increase birth spacing. Now, as I said, when we think about improving nutrition during pregnancy or just maternal nutrition in general, the first thing that usually comes to mind is iron and folic acid supplementation because it's what we've been doing for years and it's what we have the most data on. And fortunately, it's quite efficacious. Effectiveness may be a whole nother issue, but iron and folic acid supplementation, recent Cochrane review of 49 trials, it does improve infant iron status, it does improve birth weight, it does improve maternal anemia at term, iron deficiency anemia at term, moderate and severe anemia at any point. It reduces the risk of maternal diarrhea and it reduces the risk of transfusion during labor delivery. It tends to have more side effects than a placebo, but fortunately there has been some increasing work looking at different strategies for delivering iron folic acid supplementation and it looks like weekly or intermittent or flexible dosing may be as efficacious, at least in moderate or mildly anemic women, as daily. And so this is a strategy that could potentially be quite useful. Other Cochrane reviews that have been published in the past year have looked at protein energy supplementation as a strategy. And while there is good evidence for improvements in fetal outcomes, unfortunately there's no data available on what it does for actual maternal health. So there's very little information to show if giving women balanced protein energy supplementation actually improves their status. Vitamin A supplementation during pregnancy, there's been quite a bit of mixed reporting on this. It seems that vitamin A supplementation during pregnancy at doses that are lower than necessary to cause teratogenicity, because that's a big issue, um, does reduce maternal mortality in very vitamin A deficient populations. There's no effect in populations where vitamin A deficiency is less of a problem. It also, regardless of the population level of vitamin A deficiency, have good impact on maternal anemia. And there are very sound biological mechanisms for how that works. There is no impact, however, on other maternal and infant health outcomes. No evidence for that. And then lastly, we've been moving into more and more multiple micronutrients, so packaging iron and folic acid with zinc and calcium and B vitamins and beta carotene and all of these things. And Cochrane reviews of those show that actually with respect to low birth weight, IUGR, maternal anemia, multiple micronutrients really aren't any more effect or efficacious than iron and folic acid supplementation for those particular outcomes. Interestingly though, a recent review of long-term studies showed that in young children whose mothers were supplemented with multi -mi multiple micronutrients as opposed to iron and folic acid, they had much improved child growth up to two years. So there seems to be some type of residual programming going on with respect to child growth for multiple micronutrient supplementation. But there is, again, we need additional evidence on this. Now, we know iron and folic acid is efficacious However, and we've been promoting it for 20-something uh, years as standard of care. But unfortunately, we've seen very little budging on maternal anemia, very little budging on iron deficiency. And that's probably because women don't take them. <laughs> they don't take them. Now, in the nutrition community, we like to say, well, that's because, you know, the women aren't complying. They're not taking the ones that they get, they don't like the side effects, they throw them out, they forget about them.
but actually an eight-country qualitative study on barriers to iron and folic acid supplementation found that the biggest barrier for women not taking their IFA had nothing to do with them, but a whole lot to do with the fact that they were never in the facilities. The women had to pay for them, and they couldn't afford it. Women's access to them was extremely, was a huge barrier for complying to the 90 tabs per pregnancy. Additionally, we have women entering into ANC way too late, so that even if they did get them and take every single one, they still wouldn't reach the target, because they're getting too little too late. Additional barriers that they found were also related to low awareness of what maternal anemia does, what iron deficiency does, and what iron folic acid supplements can do. Without appropriate nutrition education and counseling on IFA, women aren't going to understand the need for it. And that's going to lower their willingness to take them. And not just for their child's health, but they need to understand the benefits of them for their own health as well. Another one that came up as a pretty clear barrier, rather than being side effects per se, were actually misconceptions about what IFA will do. Women were talking about how, well, iron and folic acid is going to make me have a big baby. Don't tell a woman less than 145 centimeters tall that iron and folic acid is going to give her a big baby because she's going to freak out about obstructed labor. Women are afraid of having big babies because of pregnancy complications. And that has been a very common issue. Iron and folic acid supplementation and fear of a big baby. Similar things with telling women to eat more during pregnancy. They practice eating down instead because they're afraid of having big babies. One of the other issues that we ran into is that women think, well, iron and folic acid builds your blood. Well, if it builds my blood, I might bleed more during pregnancy. So again, you see this information, this misperception about how things work. And lastly, one that struck to my heart because I work in food security, is that women would say, well, I don't, I don't want to take the iron and folic acid because when I do, it increases my appetite and I don't get food to meet my appetite needs. So we have some serious issues with IFA that go beyond side effects and women forgetting to take them. And that also go beyond supply and demand. We've got a lot of miscommunications that we need to work on. Now I want to move beyond supplementation because supplementation is typically what we do for pregnancy, though we do need to move it more towards the non-pregnant state as well. Fortification is typically perceived as a life cycle approach. You fortify a food, everyone in the population is going to eat it. We know that it is efficacious for improving vitamin A status, for improving um, iodine status. We know it's effective for folic acid, for vitamin A, and for iodine. We have less evidence that, it, or it's, that it's strongly efficacious and effective for iron for a couple of reasons. We have limited knowledge on what maize fortification can do because maize is, we're now moving into maize fortification and it has a huge host of issues around it dealing with the accessibility of the iron in that particular food product. However, these are extremely cost-effective strategies costing less than 20 cents per person per year. And in fact, we've made quite a bit of progress on moving fortification strategies out globally. I'm going to put up the example here of wheat flour fortification with respect to iron. The vast majority of countries in the world are either planning or have ongoing activities related to uh, flour fortification with iron. However, one of the things we have to take note of is that Flour fortification and fortified foods in general, especially when it's large-scale industrial fortification, may not be acceptable or affordable or accessible by some of our um, most vulnerable populations. And in fact, some of the strategies that we're using to fortify foods may be inappropriate. A recent review in the Food Nutrition Bulletin examined the 78 programs that are either active or planned with respect to flour fortification for iron, and of those, only nine will actually have impact on anemia. 
And that's because the other ones are using the wrong iron form. It's not bioavailable. They're using a dose of iron that is too low to meet their population needs. Or the population intakes of wheat are, are too low. It's the wrong vehicle for fortifying foods in that population. And so that's a problem because we're putting a lot of energy and a lot of push into fortifying. But we've got to support countries so that they make the appropriate decisions with respect to the vehicle and the iron dose and form so that they can achieve impact. Because a cost-effective strategy is only as effective as the amount of impact that it has. Additional fortification strategies that are considered as alternatives to large-scale industrial include small and medium-scale fortification. There have been some pilot works on this in Malawi, actually, um, where they used a medium-scale fortifier to actually provide premix to small-scale hammer mills throughout the country. And they saw substantial increases in both coverage and the number of households being reached and improvements in anemia. But you have significant issues with quality assurance and control because it's not centralized. And it's a lot more difficult to manage, but it's something that needs to be considered as small and medium scale fortification. And we need additional programmatic research on this particular method. We also have a wonderful saving grace, which is micronutrient sprinkles and powders. These things have been a revolution. They are acceptable, they're efficacious, and they're effective at reducing childhood anemia. However, we have extremely limited research on what they can do for maternal health. From what I understand, there's one study, and it's currently going on in Bangladesh, to look at the effect of sprinkles on maternal nutrition during pregnancy and maternal health outcomes and infant young child health outcomes. There is programmatic experience with sprinkles um, in women of reproductive age, but research-wise, we don't have a very good base for that, largely uh, for, for a number of different reasons. And then lastly, I want to talk about strategies that we don't often consider um, because they're not silver bullets and they're not easy and they're not always the most cost effective, if you will. And that's behavior change communication strategies which work to increase that diversity. And these work by teaching women about locally available foods that are rich sources of micronutrients, for example, using insects, using indigenous foods, using wild fruits and vegetables, these types of strategies so that they can source local and accessible food products. As well, we can do home processing of foods, such as pounding and fermenting and soaking, which reduces some of the phytates, which inhibit iron and zinc absorption, and therefore increase uh, micronutrient availability. There's some limited work on that, almost all in children. And while you do see increases in bioavailability, you would still need additional food sources of zinc and iron and critical micronutrients to meet needs, especially in very young children. Um, we can work on issues around food pairing and dietary practices such as drinking tea and eating vitamin C rich foods with other foods so that we can enhance and maximize iron absorption. And some of these strategies are effective, or I should say efficacious. And then we also have agricultural strategies to increase production of food sources so that we can improve the intakes of nutrition, the intakes and nutrition of women and children. And we have evidence that gardening strategies for vitamin A rich foods as well as production strategies for animal source foods, they do work to improve nutrient intakes. They may not get women to adequacy, but they do increase total intakes and reduce to some extent the burden. And they are sustainable and they tend to have impacts that go beyond just nutrition. They improve women's livelihoods. Several studies have documented that they improve women's ability to negotiate within the household. And so they address a number of those socio-cultural issues that influence um, undernutrition. And lastly, though these are very few and far between, there are some examples of integrated strategies more at the program delivery stage. Um, and this is the MICA program that World Vision conducted in Africa. They, were, they had as their project goal, and I think this is a very important goal, to improve the micronutrient status of women and children. Not to improve growth of children, not to reduce mortality or improve survival, but to improve micronutrient status and anemia. 
they recognized all of those factors that contribute to undernutrition in women and young children, developed activities around those for a truly integrated approach. They had a disease prevention and control arm, and this included water and sanitation strategies, in addition to malaria prevention, helmets prevention, treatment. They did health system strengthening through increased trainings. And they utilized food-based approaches, such as kitchen gardens, and increasing in support for production of animal source foods. They also removed, or moved, I should say, iron and folic acid supplementation from the facility and to the community, so that women came to a community health worker once a week, and if they were of reproductive age, they received one tab and then went on about their business, and if they happened to be pregnant, they received a week's worth of tabs and then went on about their business. So the women didn't have to go to antenatal care didn't have to go to a health facility that may be far away, they could actually obtain the iron and folic acid supplementation within their community. They also, in some sites, used small and medium scale fortification, Malawi being an example of that, and they had intensive nutrition education and behavior change communication strategies. And just some of their selected outcomes, they increased the coverage of iron and folic acid supplementation significantly. And I should note, that within these women who were covered, compliance was around 80 to 90 percent. So that's big. Within these populations of women, they also saw dramatic decreases in anemia among pregnant women. And these were significant when you compared them to control con communities that they had set up. So it seems that these integrated approaches where you tackle those multiple factors contributing to anemia, they can be quite effective on a large scale. They require quite a bit of input and they require a long-term approach. This was a 10-year project, but they can be effective. So lastly, I want to just highlight then some general things about what we can do to achieve impact, what we can do to increase our attention to maternal nutrition. One of those is to include women not as just the targets of nutritional interventions, because often we target them in order to improve child nutrition. But we need to target women as beneficiaries for improvements in their own health as well. I think that would be a critical sort of change of mindset that's very important. We need to move beyond just a facility-based micronutrient supplementation approach of only pregnant women. That seems to be our status, our status quo, if you will. But we need to look at the entire life cycle of the woman to ensure that she has adequate supplies of micronutrient stores before and during pregnancy and then between pregnancies. And then we need to look at alternative strategies, all new, new delivery platforms for iron and folic acid supplementation, new platforms for increasing dietary adequacy and diet diversity, and linking these. We need to recognize and address the role of gender bias, and low community and individual knowledge and awareness. Those are key barriers to improving maternal undernutrition. And we need to have a gendered lens when we do these, uh, when we start working with these strategies. And then as I'm sure we all hear all the time, we got to integrate. We got to integrate health and nutrition so that they're not two separate pillars. They're actually a single pillar complementing each other. And we need to work more to integrate our facility and our community-based strategies so that we have effective linkages, so that women don't have to depend on the facility to receive critical care or critical nutrition and health services like family planning and iron folic acid supplementation. And actually, family planning has done a wonderful job of moving towards community-based interventions and strategies. And iron and folic acid supplementation and multiple nutrition intervention strategies could do similar things. Um, and lastly, I think we need to seriously consider bringing in the Ministry of Agriculture, Departments of Agriculture, because nutrition inevitably is related to the quality of food that people are eating in a community. And food is being produced by farmers usually subsistence farmers who were selling at small scale within their populations. We need to increase the ability of a community, a household, and an individual to produce their own food. 
And then we've got to move beyond only child-level indicators from a research perspective. We need to integrate our research platform so that maternal health and maternal nutrition research is working complement in, in complementarity. We're collecting indicators that will allow us to move forward. And we're monitoring data that will allow us to move these things forward. And so with these, I think we can improve nutrition throughout the life cycle, improve access to nutrition and health services, and improve access to nutritionally adequate food. Improving that nutrition is going to improve health because nutrition, as we said earlier, back at the beginning, is really a cornerstone of good health. So that's where I will leave you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That uh, was just a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Again, really very big picture uh, with uh, one couldn't help noticing the passion behind it, <laughs> uh, which is, is uh, uh, much needed in this area. I think uh, we've got some good time for questions and comments, so I'm going to open it up. And do we need a microphone here, Kaylin? So uh, somebody will run around to the microphone. I think we have someone right there to start. Hi, I'm Jill Gay. I'm a consultant. And thank you very much to all three of you um, for a new focus on gender and nutrition and the links between nutrition and agriculture. I think my question is actually for Mary Ellen in the sense that Given the new initiatives of this administration on GHI and gender equity, how do you see um, the work in maternal health and nutrition and, and also feed, feed the Future? How do you see that moving forward and transforming this field? Well, I hope that it will be uh, all be a very good stimulus, um, and so I I feel hopeful. I think in um, applying the gender lens, which I think is, is so critical, and both of you talked about this so much, it's just screaming at us here, and this is a a wonderful opportunity to take this and move this forward. So um, I think that we have some good possibilities here, uh, but the, the great outlines for what will be done and, and funding require really lots of good ideas from all of you to get it into programming. Uh, I think also to think a lot bigger than we have in the past. Um, the um, experience uh, of uh, getting to where we want to go at national level has been so limited, it, it's, it's um, very daunting. But I think that we have to get beyond demonstrations and uh, develop serious plans. I was very happy to hear about the Malawi experience and the very high level commitment to this, uh, which which really is is what it's going to uh, take to do that. Uh, so we uh, are um, optimistic that we can make some headway, uh, but it will need real programming, smart program on the ground to take it forward. Thanks very much. My name is Nomonde Kundu. I'm from the Embassy of South Africa, where I work as health attache. Thanks to all three of you for a very uh, interesting discussion this morning, pertinent indeed to the current challenges. I'm actually just following up on what was asked in relation to where we are in the U.S. right now in terms of uh, articulating programmatic areas for the not only just the GHI and the and the Fit the Future initiative, but how does that link in the manner that was outlined by, by Doyen in with AGOA initiatives 
And we're expecting tomorrow the announcement of the QDDR. We heard also about USID forward. How is all of this, in my view, very opportune kind, kind of times uh, used? We saw the data that we can actually use to inform programmatic areas in all of these initiatives. Who is the champion to inform the, the, these programmatic areas? I see also the proportionate distribution of resources in the new, in PEPFA 2. Uh, we have a huge problem with HIV and AIDS in South Africa, and I'm happy with the distribution, but I, I, I think also that the other areas need as equal kinds of kinds of sort of financial commitments, and given the changes politically in this country, what can we expect in terms of those kinds of commitments? And who is talking to the officials of Congress people who are new in Congress coming in? Perhaps need these kinds of information and need to understand these kinds of things that need to be done, and and therefore would inform those kinds of policy decisions and financial commitments. I, I think that we have, we have a wealth of knowledge. I think that we have, uh, our minds are thinking correctly about what needs to be done, but how does that link to policy and decision making? Thank you. I, uh, I want to thank you for this question. And um, I, I, I think the first thing that I want to say is this big, much bigger than the United States of America, and that if we get a boost on this through the U.S., uh, that will be very good. Uh, but this is really where it takes partnership with countries and private sector um, so that uh, we will be part of this and our administration is taking note of nutrition needs. Um, I, I think in terms of quickly, in terms of influencing our funding decision makers, uh, they are influenced by their constituents. <laughs> And so it takes uh, people who go to individual representatives and senators uh, to speak about what they care about, and that is what influences them. Uh, I can go and do briefings, and others can, and they take that into consideration, uh, but they answer to their constituents, and so we rely a lot on um, private uh, NGOs, uh, private people, to bring messages of concern to them. Yeah. Can I just add yes. I just, and I'd just like to add to what Mary Ellen has said, that it also takes our governments in developing countries who have contact with the U.S., the Congress people, and meet at various forums internationally to express the need, but to show accountability. When Malawi, yes, when Malawi started this work in 2004, there was no government vote. And they had only three development partners that were supporting nutrition. But the moment that government decided we're going to have a definite vote for nutrition, they had like 20 other partners coming on board. And they set up different levels of accountability that made the partners comfortable to put their resources into it. The monitoring and evaluation was transparent. They had regular meetings where they updated the donors as to what they were doing. And so nobody felt a pushback. Rather, they wanted to do more because the government was in the driver's seat and they were just coming to implement the national program. 
I guess I might just add to that that in addition to the governments, that actually there are some individuals from the countries who come up and make very, very powerful statements. I, I can think, say, in an area of uh, fistula and rape and so forth, and they come in and they get heard. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a government, and it can be a government actually uh, of their own country who's not responding to them. But our legislators certainly want to respond to people of the world as well. So we have another question. You had the mic, yes. <laughs> um, actually, in response to that, I work, um, my name is Mandy Slutsky, I work with Results Educational Fund, and uh, we're a grassroots advocacy network um, in a couple different countries, and we have just grassroots volunteers that um, form relationships with our members of Congress, members of Parliament, and um, meet with them on a regular basis about a wide variety of issues from microfinance to global health to uh, domestic poverty issues. And so we could definitely talk about that. Um, I had a very specific question, I guess, for Dr. Webb Gerard. Um, this is just my personal interest. Um, when I was working uh, in Bangladesh with BRAC, uh, I guess a year and a half ago, um, I noticed with my maternal health studies that there was a, a widespread um, sort of cultural belief that you can't eat certain foods during pregnancy. And it didn't have to do necessarily with trying to uh, decrease um, intake so that the child would be smaller, but rather just, you know, certain fish, um, which fish is like the main animal source of food in Bangladesh, and uh, not eating certain fish with large mouths because then their child could be born with cleft palate or a large mouth and talk back to them. Um, that was a very, very widespread um, thing in, in rural Bangladesh in six different districts that I looked at. So I was just wondering with your behavioral change communications, um, how th very specific things like that can be overcome and dealt with in a cultural context. Okay. Um, sure, Th and, and I also want to my own experience is working in Kenya and Nigeria and some other settings. Eggs are another one. You don't feed eggs to very young children and to pregnant women. They may have a higher risk of getting malaria. They're going to have, they're going to be slow to speak. Children who are given eggs as a complimentary food might be slow to speak. Um, these are some very interesting things around, usually, some of our richest source of micronutrients, foods which are the richest source of micronutrients, and it's, it's extremely troubling. Um, one strategy that's used that's um, used with regards to the management of moderate and acute malnutrition is a PD hearth approach. Um, some of you may be familiar with that, and it actually uses community champions, so women of similar socioeconomic background, poverty levels, who actually deviate from the norm. They have healthy children. They stay well nourished during pregnancy and exploring what their behaviors are, their strategies are for maintaining nutrition in these poor settings and in areas of great constraint. And what they find is that usually the women are actually practicing things like eating some of the taboo foods. And when the women see their peers doing it with no adverse consequences, that's usually the biggest way to get effective behavior change. We had similar issues um, with fortification, small-scale fortification project in Malawi with MICA, where the women, the community in general, was very afraid that the fortificant was actually a contraceptive. And it was, it was going to actually bring harm, and it was a way for fertility control, you know, subversive government fertility control and this, that, and the other. But you had some positive deviants who were doing it, and when people in the community saw that, oh, they're still having babies, they, you had great increases in acceptability of it. So I think a lot of it takes finding those positive deviants within the community and finding peers who can be champions for those behavior changes. Yeah. That may have been a very long-winded way of saying I, I would like to ask a follow-up on that. Sure. Because I, at least as far as I know, these are studies done in communities and they demonstrate exactly what you said. Uh, has there been uh, an effort to bring that sort of thing with a, uh, a related but different strategy 
to scale. So the concerns of women get in uh, the broadcasts uh, talked about the the Oprah of Bangladesh or wherever it is, so that it can have a much broader impact. Does that work or is that a pipe dream that that might work and you have to work individual by individual and community by community? I think in some cases you can do large scale social marketing schemes um, using things like telenovela and storylines and storytelling. Um, some of the literature on behavior change communication is very supportive of using stories using soap operas to deliver health messages. Um, we even do it in this country <laughs> um, on pop culture television. Um, and you can use those to begin to shift the mindset, but I think in some cases, especially in countries where social marketing may not reach, they have lower access to radios and televisions, you, are, you may need to continue with the community-based strategies. And so coupling community-based strategies, going community by community, because the constraints are, there are some overarching similar constraints, but each community is going to have their own slant on things. But at the same time, coupling that with large-scale social marketing schemes, I think, is important. And Thailand and Cambodia and, and some, several, several other Asian countries did a large social marketing scheme for iron and folic acid supplementation of women of reproductive age and, and actually found quite, quite good increases in compliance of women, even non-pregnant women, in taking iron and folic acid. They increase demand substantially. I know we have a lot of questions out there. How about right here, this lady right in front of me. Thank you. I'm Altrina Mukuria with the Infant and Young Child Nutrition Project. And thank you both for your stimulating um, <coughs> presentations and focusing on maternal nutrition, which is so neglected. Um, I wanted to talk about the behavior change communications um, in response to what you had raised about changing those behaviors. They're so hard, but you, the approach has to be multi-pronged that you can't, as you mentioned, just target the woman, even for hers, because many of these um, behaviors and practices and beliefs are not an individual belief, but a community belief, a social belief. And within IYCM, we are doing um, a study in Kenya and looking at trying to influence grandmothers, the mother-in-law who has so much um, decision-making power, who is the one who passes on practices and behaviors and beliefs and so on within the household, as well as men, engaging men. And so not just approaching the mother, but engaging these others from their existing roles as the mentor, as the senior advisor, and also as the husband who supports. Because men often in some communities buy meat for the mm -hmm. household. And so letting him know that it's important for the woman to get access to the meat, important for the children, and treating him in his role as a man, uh, uh, not as a male woman, but as a man, and also the grandmother. And um, the other point I wanted to make was about, um, you talked about the World Vision Project, mm -hmm. and I thought that was great, the impact that they were having, but it was a 10-year project. Mm -hmm. And behavior change, communication, if any point we can get across, takes time. Yeah. And we have to be willing to give that long-term investment. So as you're planning policy and you're looking at programs and you're looking at scaling up, that you really have to be willing to invest a long time um, frame in your um, projects and proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I really I just want to say thank you for bringing up the emphasis on grandmothers and, and husbands. They do. Even in, in Bangladesh, we're finding we can't get women to reduce work because the grandmothers are telling them, nope, they, I worked during my pregnancy and I was fine and they're going to do it. They don't need to rest. They don't need to. So it is. It's a, a huge target population for behavior change. We'll take one from this side, this lady here with the beige top. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, one thing I noticed was that neither of you mentioned um, plumpy nut or these other kinds of superfoods for acute malnutrition. And I was just wondering if you thought that there was a role in that for maternal um, undernutrition, because I think a lot of time the focus is on child undernutrition and whether or not you thought there was accessible or acceptable for women to eat during their pregnancies. Well, yes, we, we do know about it. We, but as you noticed, this was to deal with maternal undernutrition although we, we talked briefly about child undernutrition, yes, those are well accepted, at least as far as we know in Niger, it's a very well accepted um, 
strategy for delivering high calorie, high um, nutrient food to, to children. What people have worried about is that sometimes outside of the acute malnutrition phase, mothers are tending to also depend on it rather than widen or let me say diversify the foods that they give to children. So for acute malnutrition, yes, it is very important, very effective, but once you are counseling the mother for out of acute malnutrition phase, she needs to engage and make sure that she gives a more diversified food to the child in very frequent portions. I don't know if you want to add no, something. And I, I would definitely agree with that because if there is a dependence on something like Plumpy Nut or these other lipid-based nutritional supplements, um, when those supplies run out, if there's not been effective strategies for teaching about alternatives to those with respect to diet, then we're back to where we started. Um, and so while they're great in emergency situations, I think they're, they are lifesavers in emergency situations and in acute malnutrition. They are being used as supplemental products for women with HIV and in children with HIV and those with other chronic illnesses because they do have such higher nutrient demands that their food supply is going to need to be supplemented. Um, but with respect for general population, um, I'm not sure also there have been some safety issues around them, um, potentially because with protein and energy supplementation during pregnancy, there's been mixed results. If it's balanced, it's usually okay, but when you start bringing high protein or non-balanced, high energy, you can have some adverse consequences. And unfortunately, I mean, I have to admit, I, I don't know the nutrition literature on that particular supplement with pregnancy, unfortunately. Okay, how about this lady right in front of you? Yeah, I just wanted to... Why don't you take the microphone? I'm Camila Chaparro from the Fanta 2 Project. Um, I just wanted to follow up on this last question um, because it is sort of a new field. Um, there are a few studies underway currently that are looking at this similar <laughs> approach. It's not Plumpy Nut. We're not talking about Plumpy Nut specifically, but similar products that are designed for prevention, looking at how those affect maternal nutrition, undernutrition. So there's several studies in Africa mm -hmm. going on. Uh, those are Gates-funded trials, and Fanta is also going to be starting a trial in Bangladesh uh, soon with UC Davis that'll be looking at very similar products, mm -hmm. but designed for prevention. So a same approach as you would have with micronutrient powders, mm -hmm. but in the form of a lipid-based nutrient supplement. Thank you for that. Um, this lady here in the blue. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kimberly Switlick Prose. I'm from Deloitte Consulting, and I work on the Health Systems 2020 project. Um, I thought the, the presentations, both of them, were incredibly compelling, and, and it kind of begs to ask, okay, why aren't we able to do more and achieve more just because of the evidence that's there? And you talked about a lot of the bottlenecks that exist from the gender perspective, um, behavior change communication, from you know food security issues. Um, and both of you kind of talked peripherally about health system strengthening activities, but didn't really go into some of the details. I mean, um, you mentioned, Doyen, you mentioned in, in Mexico the conditional cash transfer activities that have, have worked, and I think in Bangladesh they also did some similar. Um, you talked a little bit about HR, just that there's not enough staff available, and you kind of talked a little bit about the MICA project where, where training was done with World Vision. But, but I'm wondering, you know, what else do we need to be looking at to look at more systemic issues from the health system perspective to really um, propel some of these you know, the evidence that we know some of these programs work. Um, you know, there's new innovations coming out from the service delivery side, but how do we really get them to, you know, to the point of use? And, and I, w I was just interested, nutrition's not my area, so I'm, I'm just interested in learning a little bit more from you as far as what might be going on out there from a health systems perspective and what we can really be focusing on from that angle. Thank you. Uh, I think one thing that is important from what we have said this morning is that we need to approach this at the different levels of healthcare delivery system. And not just take a level by itself, but also encourage the linkages, the integration of the community with the facility level and vice versa. 
I would like to give an example of, say, a behavior change communication program that was started in Malawi as part of this uh, management of the national crisis on nutrition. Apart from setting up this high-level advocacy team at the national level, led by the president himself, they went to the provincial level and set up committees. They trained the people. They went to district level. They trained, of course, using improved tools in which you had adequate information on nutrition, which were gathered from their own profiles. I'm sure some of us know about profiles, the AED profiles that was developed. That was what they used for the analysis of the problem. So having defined the problem, they improved on the available tools. And then they used these tools to train at national level, provincial level, at district level, and at community level. So this was part of the HR aspect of the work that was done. But they didn't end there. They linked all the levels, making sure that it was the same message that was going out from national to province, from province to district, from district to the communities. The other thing that they strengthened, as you heard in my presentation and in hers, was the issue of micronutrient um, uh, supplementation. They focused on iron and folic acid, vitamin A. If you have to do that on a national scale, you know that you've got to have the supplies. You've got to improve the distribution network. You've got to make sure that they reach not just the facilities, but they reached the community level. They had all that in place. It was made possible because government put money into it and because the development partners saw that government was committed, they came in and supported. Plus, they brought in the public-private, I mean, the public-private <laughs> partnership aspect. And they got donations in kind and in cash from companies for vitamin A, for iron folic acid. They fortified their maize, which is the main foodstuff in Malawi, and it became available <coughs> to all. They had a strong monitoring and evaluation system in place. This was very, very important for them. So they could collect simple national data that would enable them to know how well they were doing. But beyond that, they looked at also the curative aspect. So they were able to train the facility level as well as the community health workers. They call them health surveillance assistants in Malawi to identify the acute cases and refer them. And because the communities were informed by virtue of the work that the parliamentarians were doing, going back to their constituencies and informing them, the people did not hesitate to bring the sick children to the facilities for treatment, and there was a link for referral. So these were some of the things that they put in place. It was a lot of health system strengthening. And like you heard me saying, I still believe that until we really get a lot of these things in place up to the community level, we would not make the limp that we need to make to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. No, uh, you've thought of everything, I think. <laughs> uh, it certainly goes into all elements of the health. Something that strikes me is in the maternal arena, we really struggled with our indicators. And we have indicators on the opportunity to give high impact interventions in antenatal care in skill, with skilled birth attendants. And then unlike in child survival, we have not had the indicators 
particularly that have been utilized uh, for what those high impact interventions are. It's easy to actually compare to, say, active management of third stage of labor, that this iron uh, provision if not utilization, I mean, there, there are things that are screaming to be um, paid attention to. And linking this up with performance-based financing is uh, here something that actually could put some pull into this uh, to get or push to um, get this kind of thing to happen and then move back to availability of supplies and so forth. I fear that our our time has has run to an end. I know there are more questions, and I do invite people to come up to the panel afterwards. Uh, we thank you so much. I think uh, we could have stayed another hour to uh, get into some more debates and 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 forward thinking on this. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Webb Gerard and Dr. Olawole, for your wonderful presentations, and all of you. For for your participation. Thank you.